come and join thousands of educators in Improve. In this guide, you will learn how to create your Improve Educator profile, view your Improve badges and e-certificates, record your learning hours in SPL KPM. Here's how you can create an Improve Educator profile. First, go to improve.eltc.edu.my. Then, click on View My Profile. If you have not created an Improve Educator profile, click Sign Up here to create your new profile. If you already have a profile, enter your IC number, without a dash, and password that you have set. Next, click Login. Once you have logged in, click View Profile to view your details. Click Edit Profile if you need to upload a profile picture or change your details. Your e-certificates will be generated based on the details in your profile. Click Change Password if you need to change your current password. Click View Badges and Certificates to proceed. This is how you can view your improved badges and e-certificates. All of your awarded badges will appear here. All of your awarded certificates and course records will appear here. Click on the blue icon to view your e-certificate for each course. Your e-certificate will be generated in a PDF format. You may download and print your e-certificate to ensure that all of your e-certificates are secured. There will be a unique QR code for each of your e-certificate. When scanned, the QR code will lead to a verification page with the details of your course completion. You will also receive a notification via your registered email for any new certificate that is awarded to you after you have completed a course. If you don't see the notification email in your inbox, kindly check your spam or junk emails. You can also add DLTC Web Admin to your contact list to avoid any delivery error. To record learning hours in SPL KPM, go to the website. After that, open the appropriate module. Next, log into your module using your IC number and password. Once logged in, open the menu and click the following items. Click the appropriate tab and add an activity. After that, select Improve from the menu. Fill in the title, learning hours and completion date based on the e-certificate that is awarded to you. Finally, click save to finish. Your learning hours will be recorded in SPL KPM. Start improving yourself at improve.eltc.edu.my today. Oh. Yeah, Cox Canva is ready.
come and join thousands of educators in Improve. In this guide, you will learn how to create your Improve Educator profile, view your Improve badges and e-certificates, record your learning hours in SPLKPM. Here's how you can create an Improve Educator profile. First, go to improve.eltc.edu.my. Then, click on View My Profile. If you have not created an Improve Educator profile, click Sign Up here to create your new profile. If you already have a profile, enter your IC number, without a dash, and password that you have set. Next, click Log In. Once you have logged in, click View Profile to view your details. Click Edit Profile if you need to upload a profile picture or change your details. Your e-certificates will be generated based on the details in your profile. Click Change Password if you need to change your current password. Click View Badges and Certificates to proceed. This is how you can view your improved badges and e-certificates. All of your awarded badges will appear here. All of your awarded certificates and course records will appear here. Click on the blue icon to view your e-certificate for each course. Your e-certificate will be generated in a PDF format. You may download and print your e-certificate. To ensure that all of your e-certificates are secured, there will be a unique QR code for each of your e-certificate. When scanned, the QR code will lead to a verification page with the details of your course completion. You will also receive a notification via your registered email for any new certificate that is awarded to you after you have completed a course. If you don't see the notification email in your inbox, kindly check your spam or junk emails. You can also add DLTC Web Admin to your contact list to avoid any delivery error. To record learning hours in SPLKPM, go to the website. After that, open the appropriate module. Next, log into your module using your IC number and password. Once logged in, open the menu and click the following items. Click the appropriate tab and add an activity. After that, select Improve from the menu. Fill in the title, learning hours and completion date based on the e-certificate that is awarded to you. Finally, click save to finish. Your learning hours will be recorded in SPLKPM. Start improving yourself at improve.eltc.edu.my today. Salam Sajatra and a very good afternoon. My name is Ramesh Babanathan, and on behalf of English Language Teaching Centre, Community and Pandita Malaysia, I welcome you all to our webinar entitled Unboxing Literature in the 21st Century Malaysian ESL Classroom. A little info about this webinar, the topic for the day, Unboxing Literature in the 21st Century Malaysian ESL Classroom was primarily inspired by well, on a positive note, I call them concerns. There is no more literature component in the curriculum. We no longer have literature subjects in schools. No more novels and poems, so no literature. Well, uh, this webinar, God willing, will shed light to all the question there is pertaining to the teaching of literature in the current scenario. And to do exactly that, we have with us today our distinguished speaker, Member Bahia Prof. Datin, Dr. Ruzi Suliza Hashim from the University of Bangsan, Malaysia. 
to take us on this quest to unbox literature in the 21st century relation ESL classroom. Welcome from Latin, Dr. Ruzi Saliza Hashim. It's an honor to have you with us today. A uh, little bit of introduction uh, about Prof. A prominent figure and an academic who does not need an introduction in the field of academia. Prof. Dr. Dr. Ruzi is a professor of literature at the Center for Research in Language and Linguistics, Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at UKM, and currently she is the director of UKM Press. Her research includes gender and literature, comparative literature, current issues and literature. Her book, Out of Shadows, Women in Malay Court Narratives, was awarded the National Book Award in 2005. Her latest book, Palestinian Eco-Resistance in the Poetry of Mahmoud Darwish, is in the pipeline. Well, with that said, the session is all uh, you for you, Prof. Um, thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Puan Farah Mardi Binti Aman, the director of LTC, as well as uh, Dr. Kalminda Jit Kaur uh, Gucharan Singh uh, um, for having me here. Um, thank you. So I'm really pleased to see Ramesh uh, and Dr. Kalminda Jit, you know, as uh, alumni of UKM. So these are all wonderful postgraduate students. Uh, we hope to get more from ELTC. Uh, you come over to UKM and, and do your postgraduate study with us. Um, right, I'm going to um, share my screen. And also welcome to colleagues from ELTC. I hope I've got something uh, beneficial for you. Uh, and hopefully by at the end of this talk, you are all, um, you would have turned around and think that literature is a wonderful thing. Okay, uh, maybe Dr. Ramesh and I are a bit um, prejudiced because we, we are literature people, but we hope we can bring you on board as well and even if you're not a literature person you you are willing to teach it in class or, or you fight for it to be part of the uh, language program okay okay can you see my uh, my slides Ramesh, can you see my slide? Yes, 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 Prof. We, we can see your slide. All right, okay. Uh, so it's called Unboxing Literature in the 21st Century ESL Classroom. Um, sorry. So I'm going to talk about uh, current imperatives, why unboxing? Uh, and I'm, I am going to show you that literature, literature is everywhere, whether you are conscious or not conscious of it. I'm going to talk a bit about small L and big L, sustainable development goals, and I'm going to just talk a bit about uh, a project which we did for um, uh, Trunganu, for the Trunganu um, Education Department, and how it has helped um, to rejuvenate the teaching of English there. Sorry, my, my, my slides are. OK, so uh, the objectives of this talk would be to identify several imperatives that inform the ways in which we teach lit English, specifically literature, to reiterate emphasis, including literature in the langu English language curriculum, to show how the teaching of English can embed SDG imper imperatives. SDG means sustainable development goals. Um, and um, finally, to explore how the colonial baggage that comes with the English rules can be demythologized through your language, my culture paradigm. Okay, so we know there is this roadmap, the English language education reform in Malaysia. And amongst the important things that are embedded in the roadmap, are uh, language learning should emulate authentic classroom use. The goal of language learning is using the language rather than knowing about it. 
language learning is paced. Language learning is not the accumulation of perfectly mastered elements of grammar. Language proficiency involves comprehension and production. Language use requires an understanding of the cultural context. And the ability to perform is facilitated when learners are actively engaged in meaningful, authentic and purposeful learning tasks. All of which I think can be done via literature. So first we need to understand the students that we teach. Um, I am from, I'm, a, I'm in a baby boomer, so I, I'm on my way out of, you know, of uh, employment suit. Uh, so we've got the um, baby boomers, we've got um, those born between 1946 to 1964, the Generation Jones born 1955 to 65, Generation X, we've got the Xennials, Millennials and Generation, Generation Z. So now we are most of us would be, you know, if you're going to, if you are school teachers or you're going to be teaching in schools, then you'll be dealing with Generation Z. So, uh, and they come with certain characteristics. So it's not, so there, there must be a reset in the way in which we teach. We cannot teach like how, if, if it was me, how I taught 20 years ago. Um, and then another one would be, we are teaching in the new normal, meaning, this is not this is not how teaching is done. Uh, since since March last year until now, and possibly for the next few months of the uh, of next year, even perhaps uh, we are going to teach in the new normal. So sometimes it's confusing, it's constraining uh, to be operating in the shadow of a worldwide pandemic. But we are not the only ones teaching that way everywhere in the world is teaching that way and this uh, new normal uh, is what we call the generation that has missed out uh, a lot in the last uh, few in the last year and most of this year we call them generation of lost learning meaning that we are teaching them you may be teaching them remotely online but how much of what you teach get absorbed or how much of it do they really understand? So these are some limitations we have uh, teaching in this current uh, uh, pandemic. Another one is that, um, another one that we need to think about is um, how our mindset, are we still, are we still privileging the West? Or have we, totally decolonized and we were we were free from colonization in 1957 but are we totally free um so you know i think through some of the materials you may bring into your classroom through literature uh maybe um an, ex uh, an exercise of decolonizing uh, you know, where you, you're not simply exchanging one author, you know, change Shakespeare to some other Asian author, but you are looking at the, uh, at the ideas that are being um, foregrounded in the, in the uh, things you teach. Um, Right, so as I said just now, we are understanding generations, traditionalists, we can no longer teach like, you know, uh, direction and control, like you are the sage on the stage, uh, but now you must be the guide on the side, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't control anymore. Um, uh, so, for example, baby boomers, uh, people like, like me, uh, we who desire perhaps a more personalized learning system uh, and people of this generation prefer in-class involvement, reflection, feedback. Um, but do we have this kind of uh, students in class now? So we've got Gen S, Gen Z, you know, um, who Gen X, those uh, between 1965 to 80. So they are they, they favor self-directed educational opportunities and programs that allow them to learn on their own timetable. 
So we have Gen Z, who uh, Gen Z students, the millennial, who are um, who prefer self-directed learning. Okay, they grow on the internet, and therefore they prefer to receive information. You know, like we can wait. Like if you ask something, I can wait for a for a week. I don't mind waiting because you know we we have that. But kids now they is you know they want it at the, is at the tip of the, your is 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 on your fingertips. Like you you press a button and you get your information. So that's the kind of thing that they might be in, they will be interested in. So how do we leverage literary materials in the new normal conditions? Right. Uh, so. You know, as I was listening to Dr. Ramesh just now, um, and I've heard from um, friends and teachers and my students who are now teachers uh, telling me that literature is, um, there isn't a literature component now. Uh, literature is um, voluntary, like you can, you can, you're given an option whether to teach it or not. And because it's not, uh, uh, it's not tested in, in the exams, so we are back to, you know, the pandemic requires us to have a reset, a reset of uh, priorities. But apparently we have, our mind is still in the old world before pandemic. Exams still take the center stage, which is why literature may be discarded as not as unimportant because it, no, you are not being tested. So, um, so I want to argue that uh, literature, um, for example, um, medical schools, even IMU, they um, they pro they they offer literature for medical students. Why? Because literature can give students a greater appreciation of the patient's perspective, their stories, and their illnesses. To become good doctors. Students also need methods of connecting with their own inner thoughts and feelings. Okay, because in clinical practice, you often have to maintain a level of detachment, you know, because if let's say your patients die, you know, you, 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 you feel sad. But uh, uh, if this happens, you know, throughout your career, uh, you know, it can, it can cause, I suppose, it can cause some kind of, uh, um, um, uh, mental block if you keep on having patients. You know, I, I know I've got a doctor who's a doctor and uh, she will, you know, when she goes on call and, and, and a patient dies, for example, and she says, you know, Jonah, you know, like it's bad luck for when she works and somebody uh, is, cannot be helped. Um, so I think by, uh, by some medical schools that offer literature, to medical students, perhaps this is a way to bridge the gap between being detached and being empathetic to your patients and to the, the to the patients caregivers. Okay, another example is literature and the sciences. If we were, you know, um, when when the pandemic started in in, in everywhere in the world, uh, a lot of people um, looked up for. Um, fiction and diseases, and you see a lot of it. Even if you were to look at Greek mythologies, you know Greek drama. Uh, there are many references to um, plagues. If you look at uh, Oedipus Rex, he became blind. His country was uh, was um, had a plague because of uh, you know uh, something that was done against nature. So if you were to go to many literary texts and they were they were selling really well because people wanted to learn what did the what do uh, literary literary writers say about pandemics? How can we understand through literature? So and a lot of scientists actually um, uh, they go back to literature to look at uh, to arrive at some some of their scientific insights. So literature aided the scientists in arriving at their scientific insights, insights that question established ways of thinking. And we, and we, when, if you, let's say you were to examine lives of your most innovative scientists, 
they all placed literature at premium. Premium was placed for literature because according to them, creativity develops as a result of broadening our perspectives, not a result of contacting them. So if let's say you dismiss literature for your science students, you know, you say, okay, let's take this period for teaching more chemistry or more ad math. You may be depriving these children of, you know, innovation and so on. Now, another one is, um, it's a way of decolonizing Malaysian minds. Okay. Um, oh, I've said it before. Okay. So, um, Right. So reasons for using literature. So I'm going back. I will go to some examples later on, but this is just pre pre ramble of why you why literature is a must in any language program. Um, Excuse me, Prof. Uh, yeah. There's a question here. Yeah. Um, which is quite interesting uh, in the sense that when we talk about, you know, uh, literature can be introduced across different disciplines, sciences and all that. Um, how about the, the scenario where lack of language proficiency uh, among students, would, would that impede the teaching of uh, literature? So uh, we have this question from one of our participants. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I understand. So uh, I will, a bit later on, I will talk about um, degrees of degrees of difficulty and degrees of literariness. Correct. Because, you know, because you don't introduce, uh, uh, you don't introduce Shakespeare to someone who's got very little, um, very little uh, proficiency for English. So you may start with, with simpler things, but I, I, I have the, and I, I have the belief that when you start simple, but this, uh, this text will, will help the, reader to nurture or to have a love for language and to improve you know you may start with something simple but you may end up reading those toy you know um i i have got students who were really uh quite you know uh, weak in english but they had they became really good uh, readers and writers so and i think it's all attributed to literature okay i will show you some examples after this okay um Right, reasons for using literature. Every community has liter literature of its own. It can be a point of departure. Malays, we got literature of our own, Chinese, Indians, wherever you are, every community has a literature of its own. You know, because that's a sign of uh, civilization. Yeah. That's a sign that you have that you have developed, that you've got stories to tell. Okay. Now, access to another one is through literature, you can access other people's cultural realities. Now, I can't go and live amongst the, um, the native uh, Indians in America, but I can read their literature and understand some of it. You know, you can't, you can't go to every country in this, in this world, but through literature, you understand the problems of colonization in Nigeria, you understand the problems of Asian Americans in America, you know. Um, another one is encouraging language acquisition. Use of materials stimulate language acquisition. And I will give you some examples after this. Another one is through literature, you can expand language awareness because um, instead of saying um, this is a stone, you can describe the color of the stone, the texture of the stone, what the stone makes, you know, how, what emotions you, you, you have when you see the stone and so on. So all this cannot be seen from the ordinary language text. Let's say you're teaching vocab, you're teaching uh, uh, comprehension. Maybe the text does not have all the uh, qualities of figurative language that a literary text normally has. Right, okay, developing interpretive abilities. Literary texts are often rich in multiple meanings. You know, uh, 
that means it teaches one to be more critical you know when you when a person speaks to you you don't only think of one meaning you think of the layers beneath that utterance okay uh complexity of human nature prepares one for the complex complexities of life and the ability to deal with uncertainty i will go back to this point late in, in my uh, you know towards my final slides but i think you know um Aristotle talks about um, a catharsis, meaning, you know, when you read something, something, sometimes there's a revelation. There's a you 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 suddenly realize, ah, uh, that is something I've learned from this text. You know, it's like cleansing of self. Um, I do not know, but you know, when I read, you know, when we read certain things, sometimes we 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 feel sad or we feel angry. It is because the text opens up to the complexity of human nature. Uh, and then encouraging creative thinking skills throughout the 21st century, artificial intelligence replaces human. If you read, um, if you read uh, fourth uh, IR uh, by Schwartz, he will tell you that a lot of our jobs can be replaced by machines. But machines cannot think creatively. Un only people can do that. So those who aspire to remain relevant must master talents that machine thinking cannot. And literature can do this. Literature can encourage creative thinking skills. And um, finally, educating the whole person, meaning, you know, not just part of your brain or whatever, but the whole person. Stimulate imagination, nurture empathy, increase emotional awareness. Right, so so that's one. I, I, I am trying to impress upon you that literature is such a, an important part of language. You know, um, okay, then I'm going to talk about sustainable development, development goals because everything now um, must be targeted towards achieving these goals. Because if you achieve, there are, if, you, if, you, if you know there are 17 goals, okay? Goal number one, no poverty. Goal number two, zero hunger. Goal number three, good health and well-being. Goal four, quality education. Goal five, agenda equality. Goal six, clean water and sanitation. Goal seven, affordable and clean energy. Goal eight, decent work and economic growth. Goal nine, industry innovation infrastructure. Goal 10, uh, reduce reduce inequality. Goal 11, sustainable cities and communities. Goal 12, responsible consumption and production. Goal 13, climate action. Goal 14, life below water. Goal 15, life on land. Goal 16, peace and justice. Strong institutions and goal 17, partnerships to achieve the goal. So you see many of these goals are actually related to uh, humanity. No poverty, no one left. Uh, one of the, the mantra for uh, SDG is no one is left behind and you see shades of people's problems social problems social ills in literature people who are hungry people who are uh, who are unequal uh, people with reduced inequality you know climate uh, things to do with climate change uh, things to do with peace and justice so when you teach literature, actually, you can say, OK, we are focusing on goal one of the of SDG. You know, we can so that we, we need we need our youth, our. The people, the students who teach to understand this, these goals are needed is they are crucial for us to remain to, you know, everybody um, should have the um, Everybody should be should should be able to live happily, to exist in on this earth in a happy way, you know. But you you see parts of this world where poverty happens, and now we we know even in Malaysia people are raising the white flag, for example, uh, because poverty poverty is rampant now. So um, these are and much of these things are are. Uh, available from literary text. Right, 
big or small? You know, is it uh, uh, big L or small L? Meaning, do you teach? Just just now the question was, what if students don't understand? That's the big L. Meaning, you you giving them really hardcore uh, literary stuff. Okay, so students with low proficiency are not ready for big L. They may be ready for small L. Okay, authors like Shakespeare, Dickens have been called literary giants. So don't give them literary giants. They will they will go out the door and not come back. All right, but you may want to just use small L writing. You know, perhaps if let's say from Malaysia, maybe writings from local writers first, so that you know you are you are giving you are giving them a taste of um, something that's palatable. And then once they are comfortable with that degree of, you know, that level of uh, uh, difficulty, move on to something more difficult. OK, so I, um, I, I, I used I, I taught last time I taught uh, uh, some uh, support staff from UKM and they were they're not uh, proficient in English but instead of teaching them for example okay vocabulary uh, or teaching them tenses is uh, you know subject book agreement and you know they were when they had to come to class they were apprehensive are we going to go things like how you did it in school but no so I, I got them to write um, short poems you know and they enjoy that. So when they enjoy that, then they wanted to read. OK, if I could write like this, how does a real poet write it? You know, so these are ways to um, initiate them into something uh, more, more palatable. Right, so um, there are there are models of literariness and we call it a climb, meaning it's uh, or a continuum, meaning it's from very difficult, very easy to very difficult. So there are, uh, this is from Ron Carter 1999. So it's not new, it's, you know, been there for ages. But so this is, um, this is uh, the first, mo the model that Ron Carter the first talked about was uh, the inherency model, meaning uh, when you are writing something literary, the language you use is not, it's not the same as how a common person would use it. OK, so according to uh, people who subscribe to this model, uh, this is what we call, uh, they, they use a uh, Shlovsky, uh, Russian philosopher, use the term defamiliarization, Estraniani, he called it. Meaning, if let's say, um, if I want to describe, I give you an example of, uh, of rain later on, but if let's say I want to describe a stone, I, I will say, the stone is grey and um, gritty, okay? But uh, Tolstoy or Shakespeare would not describe a stone in the same way. So they have defamiliarized the language to make it seem more literary, okay? And this is, and I think this lies the problem because um, uh, students become apprehensive, you know? Uh, why describe a stone that way when you can say a stone is round or, you know, um, um, uh, shaped uh, differently or something like that? All right. Another model is a socio-cultural model, which is which which argues that literariness is culturally and socially determined. Meaning, something that we consider as literary in Malaysia may not may be seen as something not literally say in the UK or in America. That's why when you look at uh, anthologies of world literature, you do not see Malaysian literature in it because of course I, I, I think the, the yardstick or the, the masters that that produce this world literature think that okay Malaysia you've not made it yet. Like in Malaysia you have uh, Pramodia who's, who, who his works uh, appear in some world anthologies, but I've not seen Malaysian works yet. Okay, so literariness is uh, culturally and socially determined. It will vary from culture to culture, from community to community, from one nation to another nation. All right. 
And then, of course, there's the cognitive model where literary language relates to mental processes, meaning when you read something, uh, uh, this theory says that you will, you, you will um, it require mental processing. And therefore, uh, one person, let's say somebody who's living in Bangi, may read it differently from, say, somebody who's reading, reading it in, um, in say, um, another place, let's say, uh, Kelantan. Okay, so even within, even within the same uh, community, but how you have been socialized, your um, level of education, your uh, your religious belief perhaps can uh, influence the ways in which you process uh, the things you read. Okay. Right. Um, so I'm giving an example of an inherency model. Uh, okay, like this one. Uh, squatting in the corner was a felt chair covered in the dust and damp of abandonment. Okay, what it means is that the dusty and damp felt chair stood in the corner. Okay, that's how we say it without all the literary flair to it. Okay, but someone who wants to uh, embellish it with some literariness may say, you know, because a chair does not squat, but you give it human value by saying it's, it's squatting. Squatting in the corner was a felt chair covered in the dust and damp of abandonment. So dampness does, does not have the ability to abandon. But these are all things that add value or add quality to that phrase or to that sentence. So that's, um, and then, um, now the second one is a poem. I don't know whether you've heard of it, but it's, uh, I've eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious. So sweet and so cold. Okay. You know, when I first saw this many years ago, so I said something like this, I, even I can write it, you know, like, but William Carlos Williams was an influential poet in America, you know, like his canonical. And this is how he wrote at that time. So let's say, let's say you show this to Shakespeare, you will say, what kind of rubbish poetry is this, you know? So because at that point in time, in America, this was the um, tradition. People were writing in this way. Okay. Um, okay, and then we've got the um, the cognitive one. Uh, this is by Amy Tan. I hit my deepest feelings so well, I forgot where I placed them. So when when you know, I don't know. If you read it, you may interpret it in your own way. There's no right or wrong interpretation. But uh, based on one's experience and, you know, the things that you have, the things that you have, uh, the, your realities in life, this may strike a person as though, yes, um, I'm a person who is an introvert. I do not share, you know. Um, so this must be the, uh, it could be a realization you have when you read this word, these words, okay? Right, so, uh, so we have literature in the classroom. What are some difficulties associated with incorporating literature in the class classroom? Text selection. So I say reading should be picked that are relevant and engaging. Now, we know that previously, uh, a selection of texts uh, is made by a group of people. Uh, and they, you know, and they have got the general public in mind, you know, text that may appeal to uh, maybe not all, but 80% will like this text and, and perhaps they were, they are related to the themes that um, uh, they think teenagers like. So these are the basis for text selection. Um, linguistic complexity, text must be written at a level that corresponds to the pupil's comprehension, meaning 
if let's say uh, let's say it must be differentiated teaching you know uh, someone who is competent will feel uh, bored with a sim with a simple text but someone who is uh, not so competent will feel um, challenged and probably will feel uh, you know depressed if they cannot understand any of what you what they have to read um, length while charter works may be easy to employ within the allotted time maybe you need to uh, cater also for longer ones for those who can um, uh, for those who are uh, proficient in the language cultural complication text should not be so culturally com culturally complex that outsiders feel excluded from comprehending their core meaning okay so um, so uh, this, uh, this is one thing that you should bear in mind and cultural sensitivity, literary content should not insult learners. So maybe if you have Chinese, Malay, Indian students in, in your class, then you know that uh, some things, bear in mind, some things are sensitive to one group of community. Okay. Right, so uh, things you can ask. Is the subject likely to pique this group's interest? Is the language level appropriate for the situation? Is the appropriate length for the time allotted? Does it necessitate a significant amount of cultural or, or literary uh, previous knowledge? Is it in any way culturally offensive? Is it easily exploitable for the goal of language learning? Because at the end of the day, we want them to be more proficient in the language. Maybe they are words, you know, because that's how I learned. I came from a family that uh, does did not speak English. Um, so, but through, you know, through literate readings of uh, novels, uh, short stories, uh, this help we build our competency. Okay. Um, right. Um, and then remember also the students' characteristics. Uh, according to research, young, uh, uh, you know, children you're talk, you're teaching, you know, between eight, uh, whether they are thirteen to eighteen, or if you're at the new college, eighteen to twenty-two. Most of most students now, most students, the millennial, they like young adult literature, okay? Because lots of your yeah, coming of age themes, things like Harry Potter, Hunger Games. Uh, is issues, uh, uh, themes on children with terminal illnesses, issues on racial profiling, issues on social problem, dystopian worlds, um, according to this uh, research done by uh, the Athens Street Press. Okay, so uh, if you have now, if you have the choice of finding your own text, uh, it's not something you like, but something you can probably uh, come together and say, okay, what can, what are you interested in? Because I think first you must trigger that interest because you trigger the interest, then the following weeks of teaching literature will be a piece of cake. Right, uh, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Now, these are lines from Samuel Taylor's Coleridge, Rhyme of Ancient Mariner, you know. He, this was the, the speaker, he was a sailor on a steel ship, the ship could be moved and he was surrounded by saline water, so much water everywhere, but he was unable to drink. So it's the same with us, literature, literature everywhere. Why do we fear it? Why do we say it's difficult, that students cannot learn, that it's too difficult? You know, I... Um, so I'm trying to change your mind. Now, if you remember your own childhood, and if you remember your, uh, if you have, you are married, you've got children, uh, I've got grandchildren. Um, we know that children, even from young, they love stories. They love to listen to rhymes, to alliteration. They, they love at funny things. They love good stories. Okay. So why, when they love it at between one to five, you suddenly stop teaching them when they are 13 to 18, you know? It should be a general progression of so something that is nice, you know, good stories or uh, simple stories to more difficult stories as they get older. So like this is one uh, author that I particularly like, if Saturn, um, for example, this one, you know, which uh, little kids love. The cat from France like 
to sing and dance, but my cat likes to hide in boxes. The cat from Spain flew an aeroplane. So, you know, all these rhyming, repetition, uh, uh, refrain, you know, you want to teach uh, maybe uh, young children about poetry, you say, okay, this is repetition, this is rhyme, this is a refrain, and so on. Um, so, even from young kids are drawn to stories and to sound systems. So, why do we stop teaching them this? Okay, poetry is also part in, in the Malay world or in Malaysia. Poetry is part of our unconscious. You know, you start, if, how many functions have you been where it's conducted in Malay? And they always begin with a pantun, right? So, it's part of us. Why are we saying then that it's so difficult to teach? Like for example, this one. Jika tidak kerana bintang, tak mungkin bulan terbit tinggi. Jika tidak kerana sayang, tak mungkin saya datang kemari. <laughs> okay. Um, so, if it weren't for the stars above, would the moon rise so high? If it weren't for you, my love, would I ever venture nigh? So, this, you know, sometimes you hear this every day. You go to different functions, you go watch TV, they always start with pantun. So it's in our unconscious. So just get, if, if let's say you're afraid, just get some Malay pantons and see the, there are many available in English. Say, okay, this is actually pantun. It's not some hard, difficult poem written by Shakespeare. Right, so that's one. Meaning, what I'm saying is that from young, children are, uh, 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 shown or uh, uh, familiarized with stories and words that, that rhyme, okay? And then you see the advertisements around us. So many of them use literary metaphors or uh, figurative language to, um, to jolt the, the consumers uh, into buying, okay? Brain food, bite for bite. So this is play on words. Nothing beats a Mac. Okay? Look at Jaguar. Jaguar, grey space, space, pace. This is a play on uh, rhyme. Okay? Um, so, it's there. You look everywhere. If students say, I hate literature because it's so foreign to me it's not foreign at all it's part of our realities every day okay this one i i i, I like apple products so i studied look at apple and its slogan For example this one mac pro beauty outside beast inside so you see beauty and beast outside inside you know from contrasts uh, play on uh, an old folk tale, an old fairy tale, Beauty and the Beasts. Okay, look at the examples. There are so many, but I've taken, I've shown you, I'm showing you some. We say the plot thickens, but here they say the plot thins, meaning uh, it's like unlike other computers, and although now they've caught up, Apple, Apple products be, have become smaller and thinner. And yet the power is still there, the same. Teeny doesn't mean weenie, you know? Again, this is rhyme, teeny weenie. You remember the song? Teeny weenie is CBC, yellow bikini. Ah, okay. Give chance a chance. Again, this is tautology. Give chance a chance. Room with a view. You know the book Room with a View by Virginia Woolf? It becomes room, room with a view. And that's the alliteration of v and v. Nimble, mid, quick. You know the, the, the rhyming, be nimble, be quick. Jack jump over the candlestick, right? So, um, again, it's there. These are all figurative language that literary texts also uh, embed in their, in, in their works. Right. Um, Okay, now if you say, okay, uh, maybe too difficult, I wouldn't go to literary. So go to Instagram poetry. You go to Instagram, you see poetry, okay? This one. I get so lost in where I want to go, I forget that the place I'm in is already quite magical. 
No, it's poetry from Instagram. Maybe I meant to love people who are on their way somewhere else. You know, like an unrequited love. Another one. What? I, I, I do not know these writers. I mean, I know Rupi Kaur. I've read her book, but Camille Inkwell, Nayira Wahid Words, you know, but maybe you may, you may want to begin with Instagram poetry, okay? Every, every uh, most teenagers have got Instagram, right? Um, what I never learned from my mother was that just because someone desires you does not mean they value you. Desire is the kind of thing that you eat, that eats you and leaves you starving. So it's about low self-esteem, maybe about domestic violence, you know, uh, which you may introduce through Instagram instead of, instead of, you know, um, people say Instagram, Facebook are all um, 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 examples of making um, youngsters feel more narcissistic, but you can use it in another way. Now, Twitter, okay, they may not have um, Instagram, but they may have Twitter. Look at Twitter, Leave Twitter poetry. Distance yourself from people who lie to you, disrespect you, use you, put you down. It, it's a lot like uh, William, William Carlos William, you know, not, may seem not literary, Okay, and maybe you need this first for before they move to some things that are more difficult. Okay, like this one. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when you stop making efforts, a relationship or friendship ends? It is because it was never two sides. It was just you alone. All right, so there are some things that can be learned even from such short words, some short, you know, verses. Now, this is written by Steinbeck even before Twitter poetry was around. Steinbeck wrote, and now that you don't have to be perfect, you can be good. Okay, so this is Steinbeck's version of Twitter poetry, perhaps. Hemingway, very famous poem. They call it seven, no, they call it six word poetry. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. So many things can be drawn from that. Is it because the baby died? You know? Uh, is it because the woman miscarried? Okay. Okay, let's say, okay, they say I we cannot stand all this poetry from Twitter or Instagram. Go to songs. Celine Dion, my heart will go on. You want to teach hyperbole, meaning, you know, exaggeration of words. Every night in my dreams, I see you, <laughs> I feel you. Love can touch us one time and last for a lifetime. Near, far, wherever you are, I believe that when the heart does go on. Okay, so is it true that every night you dream of your loved one? Okay, so this is exaggeration. It's called in the literary term for it is hyperbole. All right, so every song that I've heard has got some kind of figurative language in there, whether it's metaphor or hyperbole, a lot of hyperbole, you know, uh, the song like uh, the imperfection, like uh, perfection in imperfection. I mean, if you're imperfect, you're imperfect, okay. <laughs> um, but these are all uh, hyperbolic uh, expressions. Ah, this one, uh, Let It Go, the song. The snow glows white on the mountain tonight, not a footprint to be seen. The wind is howling like this swirling storm inside. So like this swirling storm inside, that's a, um, that's a, a, a literary device, okay? Uh, simile, okay, couldn't keep in, uh, you haven't knows I've tried, let it go, let it go. So let it go is, can be read in so many ways, can't hold it back anymore, okay. So that's why I say uh, literature is everywhere, 
Um, ha, this one, firework by Katy Perry. Do you ever feel like a plastic bag? Do you feel, do you ever feel, feel so paper thin like a house of cards? Okay, so, so, so rich in uh, imagery, so rich, you, rich use of uh, the similes. Okay, how many of us liken ourselves to pay plastic bags? So you may say, okay, can you use a simile to describe yourself? To or describe your emotion? So, aren't we surrounded by things literary? Okay. Now, yesterday I had a short... Um, experiment with my uh, nieces and nephews. I said, give me two sentences about rain. So, very, <laughs> very not literary. It rained yesterday, it is not raining today. It's raining, it's pouring. It rained and rained, the roads were slippery. The rain was wet. I forgot my umbrella. Okay, so this is typical kids who I suppose have not read a novel in their lives. Right, so but if you go to say Virginia Woolf and look at how this is what we call defamiliarization, you know, the one the, the first model, it was raining. A fine rain, a gentle shower was peppering the pavements and making them greasy. Was it worth was it worth a uh, while opening an umbrella? Was it necessary to hail a handsome people coming out from the theaters asking them? Ask themselves, looking up at the mild, milky sky in which the stars, sky stars were blunted. So this is one example where it's about rain, but look at how it is being described. And this is the kind of language we want our students to be able to write. If they were, if they are, if they are shown that this is how one person describes rain, then maybe they will not say something like, "It's raining, it's pouring," you know. They will go beyond that kind of uh, description. Another one. See this one uh, again about rain out on the street. They hardly notice the clouds before it starts raining. The rain comes down in sheets, drenched all at once, not drop by drop. So even if instead of saying the rain is is raining hard. Uh, or the rain is, you know, it, it, uh, 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 gentle rain. Maybe they can use things like drop by drop. You know, it, it will add character to that sentence. It'll make it, it will, it will make it a better read. Um, another one. Ah, okay. Um. So like, for example, just now, instead of, uh, so I got somebody to say, okay, if let's say you can, I, I show you this, can you, can you, can you improve the, the sentence that you said just now, it's raining, it's pouring. So, it, and it will, it could be written this way, warm, steady rain pours from the sky, it's velvety mint, mist, tastes like molten chocolate dripping on a parched tongue. They softly descend from the sky, giving life back to the deserted earth. The long-awaited showers have arrived and they are as pure and gleaming as an angel's tears. So, I think it's not impossible for students to arrive to something like this if they have models to read. You know, if you're teaching their vocabulary, you still putting the words together may not be the same as having read them before having read how others have written it. <clears throat> now, now we are in um, COVID situation and there's lots of COVID literature around. This is one example uh, of, uh, it came from this, uh, uh, from this website, Love in the Time of COVID Chronicle. So it explains it, um, which might be, you know, uh, which might be a good something good that you want to show your um, uh, your students, because while we talk about it, uh, some some people 
you know, like the one you saw, they 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 have forgotten how to, they've forgotten that they have kept things so deep within themselves that they're not able to talk about it. But maybe by showing them how others see the same things, that your fear about the disease is the same fear that other people also suffer from. So like this one, uh, this social distancing thing is taking a major toll. My skin has lost its healthy sheen. More mayonnaise than 10, and the granular flaking is not a pretty picture. I desperately need a strong dose of vitamin D. Um, so things like that, you know, it has done, uh, um, it talks about uh, uh, solitariness, it talks about being by oneself, uh, it talks about uh, being trapped in this place. So maybe uh, you can, you know, since it's a, it's a, we are in that situation now, maybe bring some COVID literature for them to read, for them to understand and to share and maybe to talk about it. This is one by, uh, I'm sure most of you know him, Dr. Edwin, uh, Prof. Malaka Edwin Betamani. Uh, he wrote this poem. Uh, the afternoon rain arrives, no thunder, no lightning, the smell of water again is what rain. The smell of water on dry earth, memories of paper bed sailing on drain skirting our kampong homes. Now I watch alone, homebound. So you know there are terms like watch alone, homebound. And order, uh, order, CMCO, keeps me within these walls in the company of the Peter Patel of drops from the skies. At a distance, the amazing calls devotees for Zoho, Zoho uh, prayers. So, Again, this is, you know, like um, like irony because there's four for prayer, but you cannot go to the mosque, you know. Um, so there are things in here, things literary that maybe um, can, you know, jolt our... How much time have I got, uh, Ramesh? Am I... <laughs> uh, Prof, we are, we are almost there, but we, we can probably uh, give them a few more minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. this one, uh, I just want to talk about your language, my culture. I'm sorry. No. Okay, this is a program that we did, uh, a group of us did with the with the Trunganu government. We got some funding from the Royal Foundation, uh, from the, um, what is it, Yarasan Diraja Sultan Mizan, Sultan Mizan Royal Foundation. He gave us close to 1 million ringgit to carry out this program in Trunganu. Uh, Trunganu uh, has, you no know, one thing good about Trunganu is that they've got this annual, used to be up to, I think 2020, we they didn't have it, but 2019, before that, every year they had this annual uh, language program for, um, where they had different, different um, things going on for kids in school. And I, uh, Rosawia was the, um, the date Rosawia was the uh, chief judge. I became the chief judge when she left. Uh, you know, the program uh, and so what happened was that we were given funding to um, to help students improve both their English competence and cultural awareness. So we call it Your Language, My Culture, YLMC. Okay, and what it is is that, uh, so the general objective was to um, upgrade both English proficiency and cultural enrichment by providing local culture content through reading. Okay, develop appreciation for local culture, society and its values. Because even then when we were doing these modules for them, they, they were still had the language, uh, literature component. But now I look at your the pulse books and there's very little, uh, um, you know, our own uh, local culture in there. So it's more important now that you embed this in your uh, language teaching. Then we've got the specific objectives, which is to gain uh, awareness of the richness of their own heritage, uh, uh, learn to develop their own perspectives rooted in their value system. Okay, uh, so the pedagogy was simple, it was to make English learning practical and comfortable for our own non-English language speakers. Take out the fear, the anxiety and the ambivalence in the learning process. Start with the familiar, their own local experiences and culture. Because Western content is an unfamiliar, alien and intrusive variable. Okay, so this is what we did. So what we did was we prepared uh, supplementary mo uh, modules 
for form 1, form 2, form 3, and then for form 4, form 5, form 4, form 5, also we provided supplementary materials, but in the form of uh, uh, research projects. So we have almost finished the program with them. This will be our sixth year doing. We followed students through from form 1 to form 5. And what we did was we looked at the whole syllabus from form 1, form 5, and we saw that they were, and we, de we developed a cultural matrix, a culture matrix. And we developed it using these four um, uh, aspects, heritage about language, literature, and value society. So literature is always a part of teaching uh, proficiency. Okay, so for yeah. example, this. Yes, yeah. Prof, uh, we have a question which is very much uh, related to uh, uh, the, uh, what do you call uh, the project that you carried out. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, like, how do we unpack, you know, all this uh, uh, literary richness um, with very limited time constraint allocated for English language? Uh, the, the question here says that we are very exam orientated and this is not tested. Chances are literature will be sidelined and how do we remove these barriers? Mm. Yeah, um, that's why that's why you you have to. I think it's best if you work with, you know, if you can, you work with uh, uh, different partners like uh, YDSM. And we work with YDSM, the the uh, the Tunku Mizan's uh, Foundation, with JPNT, Jabatan Pendidikan Negeri Negeri, Sela, uh, Negeri Tengganu, and UKM. So you need partnership because teachers sometimes don't have time. So for for us, we did the work, we did, we prepared the modules and then we trained the teachers. So over the years, I think we carried out so many uh, teaching of uh, teaching the trainers. First, we teach the, the, the JUs, you know, and then we taught, uh, then we taught the, then they taught the, they taught the teachers in school. So it was cascaded in that way. But the materials, we develop them. So I think universities are happy to work with whatever entity because, you know, we, uh, we would like to, we would like to uh, make sure that our research is being used. It's not just university, you do university stuff, you know, school, you do school stuff. Whatever we can help you, we would be happy to help. So, um, so I think uh, we, we understand, even while doing this project, we understand the time constraint but but what happened was that is if in, in in where schools couldn't do it consistently they had like a week off this program you know to replace and then uh, now every school in Trungganu must use the club activities that we have developed for their club activities for the English club activities so I suppose in this way we, you know, I we feel that the research is not wasted uh, because we, I have been to all parts of Trungganu. I've been uh, the last five years since 2015. Every year I would go four or five times to Trungganu, train different schools, uh, different went to different schools, train different teachers. I've been to, um, uh, you know, we've slept in hotels where you couldn't see there were there were no windows, you know. And we stayed in a place where it's uh, like a hotel which was like kedai, 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 like kedai makan, you know. Um, so, but that's the extent that you know some researchers are willing to go to go the extent that we will help. Because we want to, we want to, you know, if you will follow the SDG, no one is left behind. If you are in remote parts of Trungganu, you should also be you should also be able to uh, enjoy uh, speaking well, writing well, uh, and reading well. Okay. Now this is one example of a poem that was in Form Two book, if I'm not mistaken, called Leisure by W. H. Davis. So this is, um, and for many of uh, for many kids, this is, seems like foreign to them. Okay. Uh, so we say, okay, uh, we will, th this is what you have in your text. Now, this is what we can, um, okay, this may look difficult to you, but this is what, okay, this is a, this is a, a, a book uh, written by Awang Goning. Awang Goning, not his real name, but he, it's a book called 
a map or a map of Trungganu. But you see, you see, you know, even though it's written in, uh, you can see difficult. Okay, I wish I'll show read it. This is, uh, this book was sold out. All right. In most contexts, cari pasar can be taken to mean spoiling for a fight. But it goes even deeper to the cause. When in Fong Wang, Long Ladang went around tugging at the ponytails of girls, he was doing precisely that, following Newton's law. The following day, Mac Jarrow's uh, brother was waiting for him at the gate and thumped him one in the way that sometimes an unpredictable reaction follows your deliberate act. Boo hoo, Long Ladang went crying to his mum. And this is what she said to him. Tula mung dok cari pasar aku kata dah. See, you asked for it. I told you so. Ma Long Ladang would have gone on seeing as he was persistently crying and rubbing his noggin. Aku dok cakap bobek dah kat mung. Padang muka. I've been prattling on about this to you, she's saying. And padang muka isn't a level playing field. It's rubbing salt into the wound. Serves you right, she's saying in a motherly way. If you were born in Trunganu, you would have grown up to these nagging words. Which brings me back to Fong Wang. It wasn't as you may have thought, the Chinese shop, but the first year of our secondary education. After that came Fong Tu, Fong Tri, and so on. <laughs> okay, so, so when they saw this, they thought, you know, um, this is someone who grew up in Trunganu, who could now write a book and and the language is a mixture of their own Trunganu dialect, Malay dialect, plus some fancy English words, you know. So, um, and but it's still about remembering what it was like to be a child, the same as the poem before, you know, um, the one that I showed you before. But you see, when you see, what we wanted them to show is that, you know, um, uh, different, different uh, literary texts, will give you different realities. This, the, the, the text that written by Awang Gone was giving you the reality of a, a Trunganu child growing up with Trunganu. And, you know, uh, so they, they, they loved it. You know, they thought this was a wonderful example of, right. Now I go back to why we need literature in the language classroom. Now, Igor Grossman uh, is a, uh, psychologist and he brought 50 world's leading behavioral political scientists It's called world after covid project now what will the world be like what do we need to focus on after covid we do not know when covid will end you know maybe next year maybe the following year but what what can be done so that we that we we will we will be we will come out of it less less um more prepared Okay, so according to these 50 world's leading behavioral, political, social scientists, we should focus on gratitude, improve care for elders, pro social behavior, living in the moment, personal resilience, health and well being, optimism and positivity, patience, nature, loneliness, pessimism, despair. Not, not to be lonely, but to understand these themes. Acknowledgement of uncertainty, social connectedness, self distancing, learning from the pandemic, bipartisanship, and political cooperation. So, these are all things that you cannot find in a book teaching you vocabulary or teaching you tenses. Okay, you can find these themes only in literature, right? And this is research done uh, 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 elsewhere. So, we are abandoning literature because exams are more important. Yes. Whereas other people are uh, foregrounding, you know, making literature prominent because it's the thing that will make people better or make them more resilient. Okay. <clears throat> right, so what I've talked today, public value of humanities, global citizens, remember SDG, culture of one's own versus others, and there must be a reset. We're not going to a uh, preset, you know, going back to the old ways. Reset. You, you know, you, there are, this is an opportunity for you to do things in another way. Why are you doing things the old way? Or going, we are being regressive instead of being progressive. Right. 
thank you for listening. Uh, this that is part of the beauty of all literature. You discover that your longings are universal longings. They are not lonely and isolated from anyone. You belong. Thank you. Yes, Prof. Uh, we do have some questions here uh, right, that we would like to take. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, viewers, you're you're encouraged to ask questions via the uh, Q and A live event. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so um, I'm not sharing, right? I'm not sharing, yeah. right, R R R Ramesh? Yeah, you you are still uh, there. Yeah. yeah. So um, one of the questions that I find quite interesting is: Do you have any writing technique suggestions beside besides showing the students models of good pieces of write, writing? Uh, yes, uh, you can, you know, you can, uh, you can have a, vo you can have a vocabulary list. For example, let's say, and you can see a lot of this and it's available online. For example, yeah. let's say I want to, I want to describe a stone. The student can, can just click, describe a stone and yeah. all these lists that come out. So they can just pick, you know, like put two or three things together, but they will need to know, or is this is or ah, uh, you know, they will still need to know the grammar of it. But then they know, oh, uh, instead of just saying something that's so simple and uninteresting, they can make it, they can embed it, embellish it with color, with texture, with emotions. Okay, so you know, you if you just you just click, you say. Describing rain, describing chocolate, describing uh, flowers. Um, everything is there on the internet. Uh, the resources are there. Um, so you may want to show them the resources first and let them write it. And then and you say, OK, this is how a, a, an author, a poet has done it, you know? We cannot all be uh, Nobel Prize winners, but at least we can embellish our work with more texture than than having and then writing it so simply or you know in such boring ways. Yeah. So there's also another question here, Prof. Uh, this question says, uh, "What is your opinion of including literature into the current English language textbooks instead of standalone?" Or standing alone, part of the English language curriculum for starters, and gradually as a subject in school. So I think what the question is, uh, why a literature is standing alone and it's not included uh, in the uh, local textbooks? Yeah, um, I think I think it should be. I think it should be taught together. You know. Um, um, when I was uh, when I was teaching when I was teaching, I, I taught uh, first year medical students. I was doing a PhD in New Zealand, and they do not teach it separately. It's always taught together because sometimes um, the model where the model where you uh, if you see a model of writing, you can say okay, this is one model, and what what is what is interesting is that literature will give you several several way, several um, qualities to whatever you write and I think that's the important thing so I suggest it being taught together I suggest you know like what we have previously but you know we now is uh, CEFR um, I understand the, the global need for a standard uh, measurement of language proficiency but we have taken it on block we have not made it, we have not tailored it to our own students. So I look at the textbook and I see so many things that are unfamiliar, that seem foreign. And instead of making them more competent, I don't know. I uh, maybe uh, are they more competent using it? This I I I yeah, think yeah, having yeah. gone through the textbook, I found it quite difficult. Um Places that even I have not heard of being used in the textbook. So when things are so foreign, so which is which is contrary to our philosophy in YLMC, we say that if you know the materials, you're able to speak it, write it, understand it. Yeah, um, another thing that I think I want to share here with you, Prof, is the uh, understanding 
where or I'll call it a, a perception where this is a literature text and this is not a literature text because it's not related to a novel or it's not related to a poem. So I think, um, you know, uh, you're uh, shedding light into the area of decolonizing the minds of teachers. And uh, obviously the, the team for the webinar today, which is unboxing, I think uh, has given us, um, you know, a lot of insights on, on uh, this sort of perceptions. Yeah. Mm. So um, is, are there any questions that uh, we have? I think questions are piling up, Prof. So oh. would you like to take them? Yeah. Yeah, I, I cannot see them on my chat, so I, I don't know where they are. Where are they? They're not on my chat. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 on the live event Q&A. Oh, All uh, right, OK. OK, here they're going to ask this question. On government, do you have any cause for a non-qualified teacher to pursue further to help students in community? I'm a TESOL holder. Uh, uh, really, we um, don't I, quite I, I, this question, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think yeah. Dr. Ramesh is going to have a course. You know, you've got some micro credits. Yes, yes, yes. Ah. Uh, uh, we are uh, still in the uh, it's all in the pipeline. So we are going to come up with, you know, most of the questions that have been asked here. I think uh, you will get your answers soon from uh, ELTC. Uh, we are actually looking into planning, teaching, creative writing, teaching literature using digital tools and and, uh, you know, uh, teaching poems, teaching stories and all that. So um, all this is in the pipeline. So give us a little bit, little bit of time and, and I'm, I'm sure this this will materialize soon. Uh, yeah, for, for UKM, yeah, we, we, we would like to offer, um, we would like, I'm just reading, form one, form two, form three. <laughs> That's quite funny. Yeah, I, I even, I laugh every day. Uh, okay, we are, we, we are also encouraged to do micro credit courses. So if, if let's say there's a large group of people wanting it, we can run it, you know, so let us know if you could get a group together, we can run, you know, it doesn't have to be even micro credit. A lot of my, my friends and I, we're willing to do community service. OK, so you want us to hold and now it's even easier. Like previously, we, we need to see you face to face, but with the pandemic, we know that things can be run remotely. You know, you can be somewhere in Sabah or Terengganu or Kelantan. I can be in Bangi, but I can also deliver, you know, uh, transfer my knowledge to you. So if you need to, we can run a workshop for you, you know, not a problem. Uh, my friends and I are willing to cooperate with school teachers anywhere or college uh, students anywhere. And we can, you know, uh, we used to do that, but after a while we stopped, you know, but we, we, are, uh, we are willing to, to help, no problem. So um, I think that's pretty much the uh, wraps up the uh, session uh, for the day. Uh, before we end this webinar, if, if uh, we have a questionnaire in the form of a Google form, which will be shared via the Teams. Uh, so I'm going to share it now. Uh, so I, uh, the deadline would be uh, if you could uh, help us answer these questions. It will be very useful for us to plan our micro causes as well as um, uh, the, the on, uh, upcoming webinars that we have planned. So uh, please do uh, uh, try to answer these questions. And um, having said that, um, uh, this pretty much uh, wraps up the session for the day. Uh, Prof, uh, saying a mere thank you to you isn't really enough here. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say again, on behalf of ERTC, Kementerian Pandita Malaysia, thank you again, Prof, for the amazing insight that has really, in, in my personal experience, has put me on the right track of you know lifelong literature. We'll also uh, uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, our attendees, esteemed viewers. Thank you for joining us. We'll be meeting you soon again, you know, with our micro causes and also the uh, upcoming webinars. And uh, with that said, um, I uh, take leave. Thank you. And we will meet again soon. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, viewers. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Long live literature. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye.